Audiobook The World of the American Pit Bull Terrier by Richard Stratton Part 7 Improving the Breed Richard F. Stratton Pit Bull Gazette, August 1982 Pit Bull devotees are a huge number, ranging from breeders and aficionados to a tiny number who actually compete with their animals. Without breeders, we wouldn't have dogs, without the devoted aficionados, we may not have the general public tolerance that the breed now has, and without pit bull owners, we would have no way of knowing which dogs are the right dogs to breed. I get asked a lot, what I consider the best trait or the best dog to breed. I inevitably answer that it is very difficult to determine which is the best trait or the best dog. However, I will make an effort to list a few dogs that I think are good male candidates for anyone who has a good bitch and wants the best breeding. Of course, there will be many worthy dogs that will be excluded for a variety of reasons, including the fact that I honestly don't know everything about them for a variety of reasons. Some will question the advisability of selecting the male without worrying about the trait, and it's certainly true that you really do maintain better uniform results by staying within reach of one. However, a very high penalty is paid for blindly taking a trait and thus avoiding males that are candidates for best in the country status. Almost all dogs that are in the public stud farm are owned by people who obtained them after they had completed their careers in the ring. I have seen all but one of the dogs I am recommending, and they have all the traits that are a credit to the breed. These traits include personal characteristics such as disposition, intelligence, and charm, as well as distinguished immediate ancestors, and, of course, they all have a good fighting record which helps to ensure that we are perpetuating skill, tolerance, and courage, as well as countless desirable traits. I am being hypercritical in my selections and I have therefore left experienced dogs such as Peterbilt and Tonka off my list, even though they have an excellent record in the ring and have produced good dogs, because they are shy dogs themselves. But, to be honest, both produced a large percentage of non-shy litters. For that reason, readers should not back off these dogs simply because I haven't listed them. Another dog worthy of consideration is Sorel Preacher, as he leaves nothing to be desired. Dogs like Going Light Barney, Luke, and a legion of other greats have been left out because they are not in public breeding. In selecting a stallion, I consider the dog and its immediate ancestors. The qualities I want are courage, ability to fight, indestructibility or toughness, intelligence, stable disposition, and longevity. In other words, I expect my stallion to be a super dog in every way, including looks, but that would be a minor consideration. However, when looking for a stallion, we can afford to choose from all categories. Since I put fighting qualities first, I will be accused of breeding dogs for the purpose of fighting, but this is not a valid censure. Naturally, we want to perpetuate the essence of the breed, and if we breed for these traits, everything else, for example stable disposition, falls away. Anyway, taking it at random, here are a few selections. Obviously, only dogs that are open for breeding are listed. Henry belonging to Patrick. Henry certainly meets the requirements for longevity, as he is 14 years old and still siring young. A strong fighting dog, his parents were of equal quality. Both Henry and his father, Tater, won the classic two-hour fights over good opponents. Sooner. This dog is the classic pit bull in appearance and temperament, at least in my opinion. He apparently left nothing to be desired as a fighting dog, and his relatives weren't ineffective either, 
not to mention his great-grandfather, the immortal Jimmy Boots. Thor I've never seen this dog, but I've heard a lot about him and his relatives. You couldn't pick a better pedigree, as his sire was Snooty the dog, a consummate show dog and great stud dog, and his dam was the immortal Miss Pool Hall Red, a great show dog and stud dog, and not many bitches are. Both. Pool Hall Red came from Boomerang which I have expressed my admiration for many times. Ace of Sherwood. This dog, and all the others listed, too, has a carefree disposition that I like in pit bulldogs, and he is a handsome animal descended from such greats as Red Baron, his father, and the great dog Alvin, his grandfather. Assassin. The only doubt about this dog is that he can take what he can give, as he demolished three opponents in short order, his longest fight lasted 38 minutes, and then there were no more challenges. He has since been sold and is now open for public breeding. He was sired by Hank out of Red Baby, out of Bolio, one of the greatest of all time, so his breed leaves nothing to be desired. He is calm as a rock, a beautiful dog that I would certainly consider an asset to any breeding program. Boots This dog was bred by Hank, too, and comes from Sassy of Greenwood, who came from Jimmy Boots. This dog, like his father, is a big dog, but he has an absolutely mature disposition and, like all the other dogs mentioned, is an absolutely calm dog, not given to levity and annoying barking. He is a three-time champion and went beyond his two-hour mark. So there you have it, a partial list of breeders who, in addition to being great fighting dogs with all the necessary traits, have the added bonus of having all that individual pit bull quality that helps the breed to be so great that people become absolutely fanatical about her. Crocodile Tears Richard F. Stratton Pit Bull Gazette, November 1981 since so many dogs have been called alligator, or gator, and it was common practice to refer to a stormy fighting dog as an alligator, it may be instructive on at least two considerations to look more closely at near the animal that inspired such respect. And indeed, there are some similarities between that ancient reptile and our beloved race. For one thing, they were most evil out of ignorance, and both had their legends perpetuated about them, legends that persisted through thousands of years in the case of crocodiles. Sometime after 1793, Thomas Jefferson and George Washington commissioned a French botanist to explore the area west of the Mississippi River. The man turned out to be not only an excellent botanist but also a spy for the French government. However, in the course of his exploration and espionage, Michaud, the botanist, obtained a small specimen of alligator from the banks of the Mississippi River, and he preserved it and sent it back to France to his friend F.M. Dauden so that he could examine the animal and give it a scientific name. Years later, Dauden presented a two-volume work on reptiles and amphibians to the French Academy of Science and officially dubbed the alligator Crocodilus mississippiensis. To this day the alligator is known scientifically as alligator mississippiensis, Dauden, 1801. Note that the generic name Crocodilus was changed to alligator, by later scientists, and for that reason, Dodden's name is placed in parentheses. December 17, 1801, was the date Dodden published his work, and Mississippi was spelled with a P. There's also a Chinese alligator, but I'm afraid I've already told readers more than they'd like to know about alligators. There are several legends that were perpetuated about crocodiles and later they were applied to the alligator as it was considered a kind of crocodile by ancient explorers. 
One of the legends was that the alligator used its tail as an offensive weapon. Another was that you could tell females from males by the glare reflected in their eyes in the dark. There were many others, but one of the most intriguing was that crocodiles would cry on several occasions. This legend persisted for hundreds of years without any basis in fact. And the only question was the reason for the behavior. Some said they were crying because they ate a Christian. Others reported that they wept because they had no more Christians to eat. In any case, they were all taken, and the explorers added details about their travels to the legends. For example, Thomas Ashe, who explored the Mississippi in 1806, wrote, I heard sobs, sighs, tears, and groans of unexpressed agony in length. And after going into more detail about the whaling, he revealed that it was a crowd of alligators that was the source. Such nonsense, with submission repeated and recorded by a number of writers and explorers, is a graphic demonstration of how unreliable eyewitness accounts are and for that reason are generally discounted in scientific circles. It is for this reason that I disregard accounts of how the ancient bulldog was crossed with a terrier to produce our breed. There is simply too little supporting evidence, and too much evidence to dispute it. Finally, did the fighting dog breeder really have to worry about other breeders, as the old saying goes, cutting off the alligators' tails and bringing them into the ring? Well, not really. First, the alligator is a predator and not a fighter. Second, although crocodilians, including alligators, are unique and have a heart with four sections, other reptiles have three, their circulatory system is less efficient than that of mammals in general and certainly far less efficient than that of a bulldog. Third, if you compare an alligator that weighs the same as a bulldog, they don't look anywhere near as imposing. However, the alligator is a magnificent reptile worthy of respect and study and, yes, even worthy of naming our dogs after it. Untamed, A Little History Richard F. Stratton Pitbull Gazette, May 1980 The first time I saw Bob Wallace he was crying. Mrs. Leo Kennard I'll have a lot to say later about the recent exploitation of the American pit bull terrier breed and the slander of their owners. All bulldog owners are being subjected to blitzkrieg, war blitz, with attacks coming from all sides. The motives behind the attacks are repugnant in nature, mostly developed to line the pockets of promoters. The geographical magazine issue of the pit bull quickly sold out, and the Humane Society has made so much money, I truly believe they would be saddened if the sport were annihilated. The hypocrisy of the humanists is incredible, because they should know that they will never annihilate dogfighting, and they must further be aware that their efforts are counterproductive, tending to target the most reputable people while in fact they are piquing the interest of the troublemakers. Meanwhile, with the humanists flexing their newfound muscle for the power given to them by recent legislation, the world truly took on the air of an asylum taken over by the inhabitants. These are truly times that try the soul of man. And it is a time to decide whether to stand still or fight, a time to decide whether to abandon a valiant race or resist tyranny. Personally, I would rather fight oppression than be a part of it. It is also a time to put our own house in order. Regardless, GEO managed to get a picture of a dead cat on a training machine, something I've never seen in 35 years of association with some of the best fighting dog trainers of all time. Ironically, the clowns who did this to the cat probably got the idea from those same humanists who have been spreading the ridiculous, bait, stories for decades.
However, it may also be time for a break. A time to draw strength from the example of our valiant race. Time for a true story about one of the bravest competitions ever witnessed. A story of a big dog, unarmed, almost destroyed, but absolutely indomitable. The dog was Tony, note the bold-fashioned spelling acquired by Bob Wallace early in his career. Tony was a great-grandson of Circe Jeff, and when later bred to Madam Queen, a daughter of Circe Jeff, Tony sired King Cotton, an ace who, along with Tony, became a cornerstone of the Wallace lineage. Tony won previous competitions, and after this he was retired to a life of luxury as a stud. Tony won his previous competitions by heart, as he wasn't blessed with more than average talent in any category. No one ever dreamed, though, how much heart this little dog actually had. At least, not until the competition in Rulesville, Mississippi, in the 1940s. Tony competed with Slim Emerson's Ted, a giant who would later become famous in marathon competition with Curvino's Thunder. When the dogs were released, Ted immediately went to Tony's shoulder. For those who aren't aware, a broken bone is a rarity in dogfighting because fighting dogs are tough to hurt. Bob had no way of knowing that the shoulder was broken and not just temporarily incapacitated. Tony made no hint of this, his tail was erect and wagging, and he always managed to have support somewhere. But because of his difficulty, Ted was always ahead. Tony occasionally got a lead, but it was always short-lived, however, her enthusiasm for the fight never faltered. Finally, Ted went to Tony's other shoulder, and by that time there was no doubt that the shoulder was broken. At one hour and forty minutes, Bob caught Tony, thereby losing the competition. Overcome with emotion and worried that he had let his dog down for too long, Bob nevertheless put him down for a seemingly impossible courtesy fight. In fact, Bob just wanted to see if he was interested in trying to fight. Who could have dreamed that he actually succeeded? Slowly and awkwardly, but with an intensity and determination that lifted the crowd, Tony began his arduous journey through the ring. Inching forward, both front legs completely unusable. Tony lunged with his hind legs. Two or three times he rolled completely onto his back in order to correct his course on his opponent when his obstinate front part obstructed it. When after two minutes Tony caught up with his opponent, he had to be separated with a baton. Bob, tears streaming down his face, picked Tony up and wrapped him in a blanket. The audience stood up and applauded for ten minutes. And Bob Wallace wasn't the only one crying. Prophets and Sensationalism Richard Stratton Pitbull Gazette, August 1980 Get your facts first, and then you can twist them however you like. Mark Twain A new high of hypocrisy was reached by staff members of GEO magazine when they published their articles on fighting dogs. As any casual observer knows, tabloid magazines are moneymakers. Serious magazines, many of them highly regarded, have become a rare breed, and those that remain are a compromised species, because almost all of them are in financial jeopardy. It is a sad but true comment that sensationalist periodicals may lack prestige, but they are awash in cash. GEO would like the prestige and the money, so this makes a small undercover attempt to hide their sensational motives for claiming publication of the fighting dog's story for the delight of readers. For further camouflage, magazine ads contributed money to HSUS, $1,500.
In any case, if the magazine were really sincere in its crusades, it would reveal the true identities of its people rather than giving them fictitious names. Bloody and inflammatory photographs are shown to the readers and predefined ideas are exposed throughout the text because words are used that control the reader's reaction. The writers thus make it appear that the dogs hate each other, will tear each other to pieces, and will crawl across the ring on command to attack. It's hard to imagine many activities that could come well under the scrutiny of a hostile approach. Just think of the hay fever that could be made by football journalists. Bloody close-ups could be shown, and some photos could be taken at the training ground of seriously, and sometimes permanently, injured players. The comment could be inserted that total paralysis was not uncommon. Also, any photographer could catch some pretty good shots of the crowd screaming for blood. Scenes of substantial amounts of money changing hands may also be shown, and the writers may allude to the fact that those winnings were not declared. In the text, the writers could discuss how every player who tears his knee is unable to suppress terrible screams and how 400 players a year, on average, lose their lives. Of course, given their tendency to cram everything connected in the most remote milieu with the activity, writers will naturally cite statistics about all the children who are killed playing football, some in a dispute and even being hit by cars which they ignore because of the his desire to play football even in the streets. Taking this absurdity even further, as our writers will surely do, it will even be mentioned that football players have been known to attack and even kill people. Also, of course, brawls and murders are known to occur among the bloodthirsty mob, which is perfectly natural to understand, since we know that violence breeds violence. Prominently embedded will be the fact that prostitution and drugs are a dominant part of the football scene. Even the players use drugs, and, my God, the San Diego Charges, football team, were the focus of a drug scandal a few years ago. Yes, a really sensationalist article can be written, but it won't be, because the public knows football and likes it. They also know something about it, so reporters will have to avoid distorting the facts more than just a trifle and that the negative facts they give will be taken into perspective and thus disregarded. Unfortunately, the public doesn't know anything about the pit bulls or the fighting in the ring, so they swallow the whole circus, everything anyone wants. Magazine with sensationalist mind or newspaper or television if you want to show. As for the Lou Grant show, American television show, the less said, the better. It wouldn't hurt so much if it weren't for the fact that this happens to be one of my favorite shows, and I'm not much of a television person. It was a sad spectacle to see the writers of a quality program being led by the nose, completely believing the facts given by cowardly humanists who couldn't stomach writing a debate about me, under any public meeting. The challenge was posed many months ago, and until now, not a single humanist has had the courage to fight. Such experts are surely a poor source of information, and it was truly a tragic sight to see the Lou Grant show sink to the level of those who place profit and sensationalism above truth and honesty. Who speaks for the animals? Richard F. Stratton Pit Bull Gazette, May 1981 Contrary to the opinion of my friends who think I am too old to have living parents, I have a father who is not only alive but, at the ripe old age of 71, is also an ardent swimmer and unicycle rider. He can pull the bar and make so many stops on it that I can hardly keep count. Unlike his only son, my father was a womanizer in his current marriage to his third wife, Martha Jane 
has recently retired from teaching. My father, on his part, retired many years ago from his job as Chief of Security Force at the University of Colorado, where I received one of my degrees. Since my father's third marriage lasted more than 30 years, and I lived at home for a few years after I was discharged from the military, poor Martha Jane had to put up with me like a stepchild at home. However, we got along really well, and she introduced me to some things that I still enjoy, such as opera and stories of Archie and Mehitabel. One subject we didn't agree on and still haven't discussed was pit bulldogs. My stepmother is one of the most compassionate people I've ever known, besides my wife, about animals and people, too, but especially about animals. She easily falls prey to the professional humanists who babysit people like her for financial contributions. Although she never said anything, I'm sure Martha Jane feels that I encouraged dogfighting with my articles and thereby contributed to the cruel treatment of animals. Not being totally unaware, I have mulled over this possibility to some extent. Here are my conclusions. First, I defended the breed of the Pit Bull Terrier because I thought he was worthy of defense for his supremacy, character, courage, and intelligence. Second, I have defended dogfighting because I am impatient with the enactment of nonsense, especially outright nonsense. I also championed dogfighting because I knew that if the public were spoiled with stories that made dogfighting seem worse than it currently is then a push will be given for laws that will make it risky in fact for the very race. Such laws have certainly passed in some areas of the country. In other articles, I have consistently emphasized the proper treatment of animals. So do other creators, but right now I'm simply comparing myself to the humanists. I, 1, advocated proper dog housing, 2, urged that pit bulls be kept on chains and taken every precaution that they would not kill or harm other dogs of other breeds, 3, stressed that there is absolutely no reason in, bleeding, a humanistic term, a dog by the use of cats, 4, encouraged a respectful attitude toward all dogs, 5, stressed the proper treatment of a dog injured in fighting, and, 6, showed examples of great fighting dog breeders who, although they could stand to see a fighting dog take a beating in a fight, were generally sentimental about animals and quite vocal about their proper treatment. Now, conversely, let's take a look at what some of the spokespersons for humanist organizations have done. Well, first, they made little impact on actual cruelty, either because they are unable to do so or because they run into opposition from people of influence. But dogfighting has been a big deal for them. They have almost zero opposition and have a huge amount of publicity and public response. They, one, preach that proper training for a fighting dog is to tempt it with a kitten in a potato sack and let it finally kill it, two, promulgated the falsehood that it was good for fighting dogs. Fighting dogs being bled by allowing them to kill cats and small dogs, I wonder if such sick minds would believe that some of the biggest fighting dogs won't even molest kittens or small dogs, 3, claim that electrical appliances were good for encourage dogs to fight, and, 4, legislation sponsored by some states that requires veterinarians to report any dog they suspect may have been in a dogfight, and who knows how many dogs suffered because of APBT breeders, not dog owners. Fighting dogs, being scared to take their dogs to the vet after an accidental fight? Now, of course, the breeders of the fighting dog are not going to pay attention to the humanists, however, published nonsense may be the only source of information for certain novices. For this reason the ravings of humanists have become self-fulfilling, at least to some extent. Thus, 
We find that the propaganda of humanist groups is almost often counterproductive, it induces cruelty before preventing it. On the contrary, I hope that my articles have created a humane attitude in the creators who would not in all cases be there. Further, the motivation behind my articles has been strictly the love of race. Humanist organizations, however, promulgated their stories for the simple purpose of inflaming the public and soliciting funds. With these facts in mind, who really cares about the welfare of the animal? Who really speaks for the animals? Beasts. Gary J. Hammonds. Pitbull Gazette, May 1982. Over the years, beasts have been of special interest to me since, in theory, most are not expected to be brave. Simple observation tells me that there are as many tough dogs that bite humans, as a percentage, as there are tough dogs in the pit bull family. Most veterans felt that man-biters should be destroyed and most definitely never used in a breeding program. I believe that a deeper look inside these dogs would be a lucrative project. Through my research and observation, I have concluded that there are many types of people biters, each of which deserves recognition and comment. The most acceptable of people biters are those who are both protective and territorial. Most bulldogs have this treatment to varying degrees and the beauty of it is that it can be encouraged or discouraged depending on the owner's needs. These dogs are normally the most intelligent of bulldogs and while they are generally gentle with people, they will become a terror to the suspected intruder and literally inhale a direct threat to their owner or their property. The second most acceptable people biter is the territorial scrapyard dog. This dog happily accepts its owners but all others are not welcome in its domain. Away from his estate, he is nowhere near as aggressive except when directly challenged. These dogs are not for novices but they can be kept and are definitely a problem for dog thieves and various strays. The last acceptable type is the junkyard dog that will bite anyone at any time, just for the fun of it. Many of these dogs actually have to have their food thrown to them even by their owners. These dogs are for professionals only, and most are likely good candidates for execution. There are also excitable dogs that will bite you to get free and get another dog, cat, horse or whatever. These dogs are definitely not for hobbyists and should be kept away from these types of situations as much as possible. Bully Sun, Anderson's, C.H. Spade, and Mesquite Sam were dogs of this type. To me the most dangerous is the latent people biter that just goes bad without provocation. These dogs should always be destroyed as their unpredictable nature makes them an extremely lethal object. This recessive tendency surfaces in other breeds so why should the pit bull be any different? The percentage of malicious people biters in the pit bull family is extremely low. I believe that through the use of proper breeding methods we can lessen this. Most of the attacks that give newspapers so much coverage are usually done by stray dogs. Check the records, in most cases where a bulldog mistreats or kills someone, they are dogs that were bred by amateur breeders and usually passed down through several generations of individual frustrated breeds, most of which are equally bad breeds. So in many cases the creator is wrong in all but a few instances, human error enters into the disaster. There is a lot to be said about people biters but for the sake of good judgment everyone who owns one, just like all pit bull owners, should be very aware. Only one case of neglect can mean an anti-breed law in your area and change public support for our dogs. This is exactly what we don't need at this point. People biters, keep one if you have to, but take care of it if you do. 
Letter to the Gazette TSGT David L. Mills Pitbull Gazette, November 1980 Gazette I arrived here in Japan almost two months ago for a three-year tour. I'm based at an air base near Tokyo. I have been a Pitbull fan for many years and I have had the privilege of owning two of them in the last two years. Soon I will ship the first one here from Louisiana and the second one in a few months. Dogs used in competitions in Japan are often called Tosa's dogs after a small town on one of the southern islands where they supposedly originated. Although I have yet to see one in person, photographs depict them as beige, mastiff-like dogs. Although competitions often take place on the island where Tosa, Japan is located, I found that driving directly 10 hours north from here is an area where competitions are popular during the winter months. The Japanese call them tournaments. I read a story about how pit bulls fought in the ring against Japanese Akita dogs and the giant Tosa and were always victorious. So far around here, I haven't found anything that indicates that an Akita is bred to be a fighting dog. I'll check on that. As for Tosa, I'm tempted to put my APBT up against any of them, because dogfighting is a legal and accepted sport in many areas of Japan. A friend of mine has watched some of these competitions over the last three years. He said the dogs are all different sizes and colors which makes me wonder if there aren't some pit bulls living in northern Japan. Before I left the US, I heard that some pit bulls were shipped to Japan from time to time. This brings me to why I am writing this message to people who are as enthusiastic about the breed as I am, if any PBTA breeders or enthusiasts know of any APBTs that have been shipped to Japan, I would appreciate it if you would send me a note leaving me know who, what, when and where. I'll even write back. I'm alive and eager. TSGT David L. Mills Box 2318 APO San Francisco 96328 Letter to the Gazette TSGT David L. Mills Pitbull Gazette, May 1981 from what I've read in the Gazette lately, the humanists are really hitting us pit bull admirers hard in America. I'm protected from it here in Japan, but it will affect me as much as any APBT admirers when I return to the States. We'll have to try and educate the public about our dogs, refute political opportunists, and then perhaps in the end act in secret. I know that the Gazette wisely does not publish any material that conflicts with the Animal Welfare Act 1976 and that it does not necessarily agree with letters and articles that it publishes. But since the Animal Welfare Act doesn't apply here in Japan and the Gazette doesn't have to agree with me, I would like other breeders to hear about my dog's latest exploits. Buster arrived here in Tokyo in early February after having to drop him off in Louisiana until I saved up enough to ship him. You know the military doesn't make that much money. Buster is not a special pit bull. Their ancestors include some brave and famous dogs, just like most other pit bulls. He's just a really big baby. Once in Louisiana he jumped the fence and chased the mail truck for almost an hour. Convinced that he had lost my dog to thieves, the postman finally brought him back to me and assured me that Buster would never make a good guard dog. I bought Richard Stratton's first book long before I knew I was going to Japan, but I was intrigued when he wrote about how the Mongol king fought and defeated all other dogs, including a 60-pound Tosa from Japan. Mr. 
Stratton didn't elaborate much on this and I got little credibility from the Mongol king, who didn't look like he weighed more than 30 kilos. At that time, the limited information given by Mr. Stratton matched my shall we say limited knowledge of our race. Before Buster arrived in Japan, I knew a Japanese man who owned a few Tosas. Through many sign language, photos, and pictures drawn on the ground, we decided that I would be shipping a pit bull to Japan. When he arrived, I was supposed to take him here and there. Mr. Togai has three large male Tosas, a 60-pound female, and a calf. Their oldest dog, 13 years old, is a three-time champion and is now used primarily as a trainer for the younger dogs. Being such an old dog, his teeth are pretty worn down, but he still has a lot of fight in him. The old warrior weighed well over 60 kilos, but Buster at 30 kilos managed to get on top of the bigger dog. Once he figured out what he was doing, I think he was super happy I was allowing him to mix it up a bit, he climbed on top and stayed there until I pulled him away. This Tosa had big folds of skin hanging from his jaw and Buster was really shaking. It wasn't hurting the old dog as much as he just lay there, sort of wishing Buster would go away. The next time I took Buster into town, I teamed him up with two large Tosas. Both weighed over 50 kilos. One was brought for the occasion by one of Mr. Toga. In both meetings, Buster was so much faster and appeared to be just as strong, if not the strongest, of the big dogs. All these Tosas could do everything defensively as Buster was super offensive all the time. Reminds me of some kind of happy alligator in a duck farm. Both meetings took almost 20 minutes each. The Tosas don't want this happy American pit bull anymore. I don't think the Tosa is bred for courage, if the six or seven I've seen in action are representatives of the breed. They seem to have a push-slash-pull competition, so if one makes a turn or yelps, he loses. The relatively bloodless brawl, coupled with the short duration, doesn't seem to lend itself to making a brave breed. And finally, they are not as good-looking as pit bulls. That must be the end of Buster's illustrious fighting career. He has always been a family dog and will remain so. I wish I knew really what he would do and now I do. It just goes to show that a not-so-special pit bull is happy and eager to pick up other dogs twice his size and beat them all up. So long for now from the land of the rising sun. Before I go though, I would like to recommend Mr. Stratton, the book of the American Pit Bull Terrier. It should be required reading for everyone at the Humanist Society, lawmakers, and anyone who thinks we feed our puppies, 90 puppies and kittens to give them the lust for blood. What a joke. I welcome mail from pit bull breeders anywhere in the world. Alive and eagerly. TSGT. Dave Mills. Box 2318. APO San Francisco 96328. Conditioning. Don Carter. Sporting Dog Journal, May June 1982. I'm not an expert nor do I expect to be one when I have to feature a dog. However, some common sense rules and some established rules will often prevail. Everyone has their own trick or trick about conditioning and I don't want to open myself up for a public meeting but if anyone wants to ask me a question or two they can send them to the magazine. The first and foremost aspect of shaping the dog is to get him as healthy as possible. 
I don't want to get too scientific other than to say that to keep your dog breathing properly, his red blood cells that carry oxygen in his blood must be functioning well. A trip to your local vet will suffice and a complete blood test is of the utmost importance. Once this blood test is done, it will also check for heartworms, the dog then needs to be checked for heartworms. This is easily accomplished by taking fresh feces to your veterinarian. If your dog's blood is normal and the stool is negative, then the work can proceed, slowly. More if a good dog was ruined with hard work while the dog was not ready. I personally like to put a dog on a cable at least 30 meters long for 30 days minimum and 60 days if it's a very fat dog, this will help the dog to lose some weight. I have always emphasized walking the dog on a leash. I know some people will disagree, but walking the dog not only helps the dog physically and emotionally but helps me solve any problems that may arise. Walking can never mistreat a dog. So after I've walked my dog the required distance, and I'll talk about that in another article, I make sure he's exhausted before putting him on the treadmill, a device that gets the dog running. At the place. I like the type that has free rotation, the type that a dog can easily pull. The work must be done with extreme care as overworking is so easy. What every breeder hopes to accomplish is work the dog almost to exhaustion but stop while the dog still has an interest in what he is doing. This is a key to conditioning, stopping before the dog is exhausted. If a dog doesn't start on the mat, place him on it and speak gently with encouraging words, he will eventually gain your trust and get the job done. Patience is the key here. Screaming and yelling or, even worse, hitting the dog will never accomplish anything. Start work slowly and don't be afraid to let your dog rest a day or two every week or more depending on the dog. Again, Without getting too scientific, all muscles must recover and regenerate to become strong. And remember, what we're looking for is a rocked athlete, not a bunch of muscle. A good rule of thumb to follow for a dog on the treadmill, so you can see if you are hurting him or not, is to keep an eye on his tongue. If your tongue sticks out and curls at the tip and sticks out, then stop. It might be time to get him off the treadmill and walk him for 10 minutes and clean his mouth with some cool water. Basically, what I have to say might seem silly to most breeders who already know all of this, but we're so paranoid about newbies that maybe this stuff can help. Simply remember, a dog builds attitude and muscles the same way we do, extensive progression from slow paces to harder, longer-lasting workouts. Think about it, and always talk to your dog and praise him during his exercises. It's also important to have a nice, clean bed, free of bugs, for your dog to get its own rest. Sunshine should never be neglected, and all fresh, clean water you can drink. I like to work, without dieting, to take a pound a week off my dog. I work my dog to maintain his weight, while some people cut their dog's weight below his ideal weight and then work from there. It should be easy, by now, to see that working a dog is a fluid situation. One of the biggest mysteries, and there really aren't any, in working a dog is finding what kind of work he likes best. This isn't always easy, but it's worth the effort if you have a good dog. Some of them like the treadmill, others a turntable, and some like to exercise outside while you pedal your bike. You must be willing to learn, and it doesn't hurt to vary your exercise from time to time. Last but not least for this article is to never let your dog get too skinny. For years breeders thought that a skinny dog was a cut dog. Bah! 
A good rule of thumb would be to pay attention to your backbone, try to keep a good coat over it and maintain it. If you think your dog is fine at 21 pounds, it won't hurt him if he goes to 22 pounds it will be risky to go to 20 pounds. I'll say more about that later, but in my opinion, I like to throw in an extra pound to get you ready for later. How many times have you heard a breeder say, he used to be so much better in fights? If any of you are boxing fans just remember what happened to Tommy Hearns. He had to dry himself out to reach 70 kilos, he made it to weight but in the process lost his devastating punch and power, and the fight? Sound familiar? Dogs are equal and I defy anyone to prove otherwise. One veteran, Ham Morris, used to have his dogs look almost fat. It worked for him because he won against Tudor and Curvino types and this was never an easy task. Of course, we all want to remove as much fat as possible without getting into muscle tissue. Sound hard? You bet it is. In short, let me say this. Your dog must be healthy and you must be willing to exercise extensively, hard hours and try to remember, patience is key. That was the seventh part of the audiobook. The World of the American Pit Bull Terrier. By Richard F. Stratton. My name is Rodolfo Louise, and I invite everyone to enjoy the knowledge of this wonderful breed. Subscribe so you don't miss the next video. God bless you all. I went.